You are listening to a sermon by Dr. Richard Caldwell produced by Walking in Grace. Walking in Grace is a listener-supported ministry. Visit walkingingrace.org media to learn how you can help these messages reach more people. Well, good morning, dear church. It's good to meet with you this morning in this way. We continue to long together for the day that we meet together face to face again. And our prayer is that it won't be very long. But until that time comes, as I shared with you this week in in my letter, what we strive for is faithfulness. What we strive for is to be constant in these days. And I was just thanking the Lord this morning uh, for the faithfulness that that I see even here today, uh, those who are serving us in song, those who are serving our congregation through uh, the media ministries that are on display, the, 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 uh, the video and all the rest. Just thankful for people who uh, demonstrate their faithfulness in these days. So I'm thankful for you, church, thankful for the faithfulness on display in you. And all of our thanks goes to God. Uh, even as we thank the Lord for each other, we always do it in a Godward fashion because we know He is the explanation for the good things that we see even in one another. So today our hearts are full of thanks, but we also uh, have on our lips prayers that ask the Lord to get us beyond these days and back to that time where we're meeting together again. This morning we're in Romans chapter 7 and looking at verses 4 through 6, specifically and especially verses 5 and 6, but I want us to read beginning with the first verse again down to the sixth verse, Romans chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. Paul writes, Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she would be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code." I think it's true to say that since the Lord has saved us, perhaps the most frustrating part of the Christian life are those times that we are grieved by our own sinfulness. Nothing troubles the genuine Christian more than his or her own sinfulness. We're troubled by a frustrated desire for complete holiness. We don't just want consistent holiness. What we desire is complete holiness. We look forward to the day when we will no longer know this battle that we know with sin. We look forward to a day that's promised to us when we will know sinlessness. That's what we desire right now, but it's not what we know right now in our experience. Not only are we frustrated by our sinfulness, but hand in hand with that, we're also frustrated oftentimes by what we perceive to be a lack of growth. We want to grow spiritually. We want to be more and more like our Savior. And sometimes if we're honest, we wonder why we are not growing more than we are. Maybe even we imagine perhaps there's something we're missing. Maybe there's some some key to Christian growth, some key to the Christian life that we've not yet discovered because we so desire to be more than what we are. And yet, even in the midst of all of those struggles, there is something uh, 
powerfully comforting. And that is the very fact that we desire these things, the the desire for sinlessness, the desire for spiritual growth, the very fact that we desire these things says that we are no longer who we once were. We are not yet what we will be. We are not yet what we desire to be, but we are certainly not what we once were. The Lord has indeed saved us. He has indeed changed us. And what we're learning in Romans 6 and in Romans 7 is that salvation has not only changed us in the sense of giving us a new nature, but it's changed our relationship um, to our past. We, we, We have a changed relationship to sin itself. And now we're learning in Romans 7, we have a changed relationship to the law of God. Our relationship to sin is forever changed, but our relationship to the law has also forever changed. And we're learning that these two things are actually related to each other. This is what the seventh chapter of Romans is dealing with, questions regarding the law of God. Paul raised that issue in the sixth chapter when he said we're no longer under law, but we're under grace. Well, then what is our relationship to the law of God? What is the Christian's condition as we examine that relationship to the law? What is our spiritual condition now that the Lord has saved us? And specifically, what is the relationship between the Christian and the law when it comes to the matter of sanctification? Paul has dealt with our relationship to the law in the matter of justification, but now in chapter 7 of Romans, he's dealing with our relationship to the law in terms of sanctification. What we're thinking about today in our verses is the death that produces fruit for God. Paul tells us that we have died. We have died to the law so that we might now produce fruit for God. There's a death that produces fruit for God, and and that's what we think about in verses 5 and 6. Two main points this morning. Number one, fruit for God requires death to the law. That's verses 1 through 4. And number two, fruit for God requires life in the Spirit. That's verses 5 and 6. So we begin this morning with the first four verses. I know we dealt with these in depth last week, but we need to revisit them. There are certain things that I want to reaffirm and... and, uh, established perhaps in a deeper way in our understanding. So point number one is this, fruit for God (coughs) requires death to the law. Look again at verse one, or verse four rather. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. You have died to the law, verse four, in order that we may bear fruit for God, into verse 4. Now just walk through these ver- th- that verse with me carefully and notice five things that Paul affirms in this one verse. First of all, a real death has occurred. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law. You have died to the law. Well, what does that mean? Well, To understand what he means, we need to remember that the law has more than one purpose. The law is given to reveal God's character. The law gives expression to God's will, His moral will. The law exposes our sinfulness. The law condemns our sinfulness. The law demands the penalty for sin, which is death. What the law cannot do, however, and what it was never intended to do, is save us. The law has the power to expose our need for salvation, but the law in and of itself cannot save, nor was the law ever intended to sanctify us. I mean by itself, I mean apart from salvation. The law, just give the law of God into into an unregenerate man's hands and teach him the law, it will never save him, it will never sanctify him. That's not what the law was intended to do. No, in order for us to be saved, Christ, our representative, Christ, our substitute, he had to answer all of the law's claims upon us. He had to fulfill the law in order for you and I to be saved. He he first lived for us under the law. He lived for us and fulfilled all of the law's requirements with his own life, with his own righteousness. And then he died for us. And when he was dying on the cross, he was dying in our place. 
He represented us there not only in his life, but in his death, which means that we died with him in terms of his representation. When he died, we died. And as a result of that death, as a result of our faith in Christ, our sins are now forgiven. Righteousness has been given to us as a gift. We are reconciled to God. A new union exists. Union with the Son of God. So that the old man, this is the language Paul uses, the old man, who we were in Adam, who we were before Christ, the old man has died. And now we're a new man in Jesus Christ. A new creation has come into existence. You and I are the very work of God, Christian. God has brought this new man into existence. And when that happened... Our old relationship to the law was done. In that sense, we died to the law. And as we're learning here, we died to the law in more than one way. We died to the law in terms of its pronouncements upon us. Outside of Christ, as I said, the law exposes our sin. The law judges our sin. The law demands the penalty for sin. We've died to that through the body of Christ. When Christ died, that was answered for. Our sins were answered for. The law has no more claim upon us from that vantage point. So so we died to the penalty of the law. But what we often don't think about was that in our unregenerate state, we not only had a relationship to the law with respect to its penalty, we also had a certain relationship to the law with respect to to power. The law of God operating upon an unregenerate person's heart and mind and life exerted a certain influence on the unregenerate person. The law is good. The law is perfect. The law is God's. Nothing wrong with the law. But the law exposed to an unregenerate person actually produces something in that unregenerate person that had to be broken if we were to, be, if we were to bear fruit for God. You say, what is that influence? Well, we'll deal with it in depth in verses 5 and 6, but let me just state it right now. What the law did when we were lost was it actually stirred up sinful passions within us. The law not only exposed our sin, the law actually agitated our sin. Again, no fault of the law, the fault was in us, but this was the practical effect of unregenerate humanity being exposed to the law of God. It actually agitated our sinfulness, stirred it up within us. I think this is an amazing reality because What's interesting to me is this, the claim of the legalist is that when you preach the message of grace, it leads to more sinning in the people who hear it. What the Word of God tells us in contrast to that is that when someone is brought into the realm of grace, when they not only hear the message of grace, but they receive it and embrace it in Jesus Christ, that does not stir up more sinning. No, no, God has so changed our hearts, we now desire to please God and to serve God. That doesn't stir up more sinning. But when you take the law of God and present it as if you can be saved by keeping it, as if you're going to be sanctified apart from the Spirit of God by by learning the rules and keeping the rules, Paul says that actually does increase sinning. The message of those who would criticize the message of grace is, in fact, the message that stirs up sin in human beings. So the very thing they accuse the message of grace of producing is is that which their message produces. If you try to be saved by keeping the law, you're actually going to not only see your sinfulness, you're going to increase your sinning. And so if we were going to bear fruit for God... All of that had to be in our past. All of that had to be done away with. There had to be this death. And Paul says that death did occur. You have died, he says, to the law. Now, second thing he tells us, that death was the work of God. That death was the work of God. Likewise, my brothers, you also have have died, have died to the law. Uh, In the English Standard Version where it says, 
We have died, translates thenatao, which is in the passive voice. The subject receives the action. This is why the New American Standard translates it, we were made to die to the law. God is the one who worked this death in our case. This death to the law is the work of God. It's not explained by some action that we took. It's not explained by something that was made possible by us. If we had been left to ourselves, this new relationship to the law of God, this new relationship to the Spirit of God would have never come to pass. No, God had to do this, and He did. So we've experienced a real death. This death is explained by God Himself. This death is, third observation, this death is only possible because of the death of Christ. He says, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law or were made to die to the law, you could say, through the body of Christ. If we were to die, Jesus had to die. The sacrifice of Jesus was necessary for our new freedom. If Christ does not die, then we are still in our sins. If Christ does not come from heaven and live a sinless life and die on the cross as our substitute, if He's not raised from the dead, we are still in our sins. We are still bound to the law. We are still under sin bound to the law not only in terms of its power upon us, exerting an influence that would increase our sinning, but bound to its penalty, bound to its pronouncements of condemnation upon us. Christ died to set us free from that. And all of this, fourth observation, all of this always had a particular purpose in view. All of this was aiming at something. He says in verse 4, so that, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead. Remember Paul's analogy that he uses earlier of marriage. Christ died to bring us into a union with himself. This is how our death to the law was to be affected. This was how our death to the this was the result of that death to the law. Christ would die to set us free from the law, but He would also die at the same time to bring us into a resurrection union with Himself. This was in view the entire time, that we would belong to God in Christ Jesus, that we would be made alive together with Christ. He died so that we might live. But then notice there's a second purpose statement. He says in verse 4, we died to the law through the body of Christ so that, so that you may belong to another, to him who's been raised from the dead. That's Jesus himself. But now notice the second purpose statement, in order that, in order that we may, may bear fruit for God. All along what is in view is fruit, that God would save a people for himself that would then bear fruit in the realm of godliness. This is his point. It's an amazing one. Don't miss it. There is no fruit for God if there is no death to the law. Christ died so that we might die to the law and be joined to Him, and the purpose all along was that we would bear fruit in the realm of godliness. Legalism will never produce fruit for God. Try to keep the law for salvation and you will not bear fruit for God. Works-based salvation is an empty, fruitless lie. No one who thinks they can earn their way to God has the Spirit of God. No one who thinks they can earn their way to God has ever placed their trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. No one who thinks that he or she can keep the law of God and be justified by it, no one like that will ever bear fruit in the realm of godliness. Now, if you've been a believer for some time, that, that may seem like a you know, pretty benign statement. You may say, well, we know that. But I think it's good for us to pause sometimes and just let it sink in. This is actually a, a monumental statement. This is an earth-shaking statement. I say that because 
every religious system, virtually every religious system outside of biblical Christianity is a works-based religion. There's the way of grace found in Jesus Christ, then there's the way of works found in virtually every other religious system on the face of the planet. False religion is man-centered. False religion is is merit-based. You live a certain kind of life and you get what you deserve. But in order for there to be any salvation in such a system, you have to bring God down and you have to elevate man. You have to bring his standards down. You have to elevate your performance in your own view so that it's actually possible to earn salvation by living a good enough life. And what Paul is teaching us here means that any attempt to be justified by, in that sort of way, in a, in a works-based system, anything like that actually represents, no matter what it seems like in your own view, it actually represents from God's point of view something that is utterly fruitless with respect to righteousness. We learned this earlier. In our lost state, we were free from righteousness. So this means all of their teachings, all of the people meeting together you know, prior to this virtual age, this season we're in right now, when, when all these folks would meet together in their temples, in their places of worship, and, and there they would have their teachings, and there they would have their priests in some cases, their temples, their icons, their rituals, their high days. Think about all the souls sitting in those places, submitting themselves to that teaching, submitting themselves to that system of religion, All of it is lying. All of it is fruitless. All of it is dead to God. It will never bear fruit. It's fruitless. What we're talking about is the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're saying the only way to be saved is Christ, the only way for there to be fruit for God is that there has to be death to the law. Not only a death to our old position, our old condition, but a death to all the false hopes and strivings that characterized us in our old condition. Until you have the Spirit of God, the best that the law of God can do in your case is show you that you need a Savior. It cannot save you. It cannot sanctify you. In fact, it will do just the opposite. It will not only expose your sin, it will increase your sinning. So fruit for God required death to the law. That's verses 1 through verses four, verse 4. Okay. Second point, because Paul doesn't stop there. Fruit for God also required life, not just a death, verse 4, but now life in the Spirit. Look at verse 5. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Martin Lloyd-Jones, when he preached this text, he he made the point, and I agree with him, that verses 5 and 6 actually represent the key to the entire seventh chapter of Romans. What we've just arrived at in verses 5 and 6, these two verses, the statement that he makes, these two verses combine to make a statement about the law, about the Christian's condition, about sanctification. This statement is the key to grasping what Paul is teaching in the entire chapter of Romans 7, even into the first part of chapter 8. Lloyd-Jones said that these two verses represent the key to Paul's doctrine concerning the law. He said they are essential to an understanding of the doctrine of sanctification. I agree with all of that. And so let's take note of what he says here. First of all, I want you to notice these two verses answer a question, don't they? Notice the first word of verse 5, for, for, because, we could say. He says, 
there had to be this death in order that we would bear fruit for God, verse 4, because here's why that death was necessary. See, the, 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 the question is not stated, but it's clearly implied. And these verses answer the question. Why was this death necessary? And remember, we died in order to be joined to Christ. So why was this union necessary for fruit bearing? How does this all work out? That's what Paul's doing in these two verses. He's explaining why we had to die to the law. He's explaining why this union with Christ is necessary to fruit, fruit bearing. So these verses answer a question. And one of the things that are solved by what God has done is what our relationship to the law once was. We've mentioned this several times, but now notice he's going to explain it to us very clearly. He says, for while we were living in the flesh, okay, what was our relationship to the law? Well, he says, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So I said earlier, we, we didn't just have a relationship to the law concerning its pronouncements, condemned us. We had a relationship to the law that was not fruitful because the result of our exposure to the law in our unregenerate state was a a negative result. It was the increase of sinning, the increasing nature of the exposure of our sinfulness by behavior and by thinking, by attitude. Our sinful passions, he says, were aroused by the law. Now, there's some key terms here we need to be clear upon. First of all, he describes our former condition as being in the flesh. You see that? Well, for while we were living in the flesh, what does he mean when he says we were in the flesh? Uh, the Greek word for flesh, sarx, it, it's used in a lot of different ways in the New Testament. Sometimes this word is used to speak of the whole of humanity. All flesh would just mean all humanity. For example, in Luke chapter 3, Verse 4, dealing with uh, quoting Isaiah the prophet, it says, as it is written in the, book of the wor- in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways. And then Isaiah said this, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And so flesh there just refers to humanity. Sometimes the word flesh refers to the body itself. Second John, the seventh verse says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. What do some false teachers deny? That Jesus came into the world physically, that he really had a body. Some of the Gnostics claim that Jesus only had the appearance of a body, never really had a body, didn't come in the flesh. So their flesh just refers to the the body itself. Sometimes it's used to speak of the earthly realm. Hebrews 12.9 says, besides this, we've had earthly fathers. Earthly there translates the word flesh. Earthly fathers. Fathers in the flesh, fathers who belong to this realm, the earthly realm. Sometimes flesh refers to the sin principle, the the sin that we experience in our lives internally since we've been saved. Colossians 2.23 is an example. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom, talking about um, legalistic acts that involve refusing yourself certain things bodily. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And there he's referring to the principle of sin. But here, what Paul's referring to, and, and the way this word is sometimes used, is just a summing up of what our life was before we knew Christ. To be in the flesh is to be unregenerate. To be in the flesh is to be natural. As we were from birth before we knew Jesus. Or if you want to understand this in terms of a contrast, this is life without the Spirit of God. In fact, that's the contrast we find in our verses. 
He says in verse 6, but now we're released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit. See, this is the new relationship now we have, life in the Spirit. That's why I said fruit for God didn't just require death of the law, it requires life in the Spirit. And this is the contrast. We once were in the flesh, but now we know life in the Spirit. We once were unregenerate, but now we are born again, new creation. He makes this crystal clear in the 8th chapter of Romans when he writes in the ninth verse, you, however, speaking to believers, you, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. Are you in the flesh or in the Spirit? Well, do you have the Spirit of God? Do you have the Spirit of Christ? If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're in the flesh. If you have the Spirit of God, you're not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit. Same kind of contrast is seen in Galatians 4.28, when Paul wrote, Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. You, believers, are children of promise. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also is it now, or it is now. Right now, the persecution that believers face in this world, what's the difference between the persecutors and the persecuted? The difference is... One has been born according to the flesh, the other has been born again. The other has the Spirit of God. Same point Jesus made to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, when he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So what was our condition, verse, verse 5? We were living in the flesh. That is to say, we were unregenerate, we were natural, we were, that, we were without the Spirit of God, we were without the new nature, we were without the forgiveness of our sins, we were without a right standing with God based upon the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, we were without life, we were without hope. He's talking about our former condition in the flesh. And he says, not only was, was this our condition, but in that condition we were confined. We were imprisoned, as it were. He says, for while we were in that condition, living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Why is death to the law necessary to bear fruit for God? Well, because until you've died to the law, the only thing the law does in your case is it condemns you and it, in a sense, confines you. It holds you prisoner. It stirs up within you what is there to be found, which is sin. The law could only restrain sin in our case before we knew Jesus. It could only restrain sin externally. There was no power in the law to restrain sin internally. The law pronounced certain punishments for sin, and so maybe it would allow people to constrain their sin externally. But internally, passions were aroused this became manifest in people's lives, our lives, others. Our speech showed our sinfulness. Our thinking revealed our sinfulness. Our ambitions revealed our sinfulness. Paul's going to deal with all this in Romans 7. Our, our uh, attitudes, our choices all revealed the presence of spiritual death. A slavery was on display. We were slaves to sin under law. Do you understand how that truth still is so needed to inform how we try to do ministry? The implications of this are, are, are important. What does this say to us? It says that the problem that exists in human beings is not chiefly intellectual. What, what did the law do? It aroused our passions, desires, lusts. 
You could teach us the law. We could, we could learn it intellectually. We could know what the rules of God were, what was right, what was wrong, what was righteousness, what was sin. The problem, however, was not just in our thinking. It was in our passions. You could tell us what was right, but we had no real desire for what was right. Not in a saving sense. Not in the kind of way we know now that we're regenerate. In our unregenerate state, when we were in the flesh, we didn't have an appetite for that which the law of God identified as pleasing God. That wasn't where our hearts were at. And so do you understand that as you seek to minister to someone, you can give them all the right information in the world, but if they are still in the flesh, they have no capacity to live out what you're teaching them. They must be born again to live out what you're teaching them. And so the best you can do when you attempt behavior modification in someone else's life, the best you'll ever be able to do is to curb sin externally. But there's no power found in you and there's no power found in them to transform a life. No, the problem that exists in the unregenerate can only be remedied by new life, new life in Jesus Christ. It's wonderful to know this, isn't it, that what we think about as salvation, it's not just psychological in nature. If it were just psychological in nature, then just give people a new way to think. It's not behavioral in nature. It's not just learning new ways, because if that were the case, you could just give people the law of God and say, now, now live it out. Learn the new rules. Change your life. No, salvation is explained by nothing less than a miracle. God transforms our very nature in union with His Son, Jesus. And so as we strive to minister to other people, we're not just giving them information. What we're aiming at first, the, the starting place must be the new birth. The starting place must be faith in Christ, life in Christ. There must be new life in order for there to be fruit for God. This also explains something else that we often deal with, and that is the person who claims they know Jesus, but their life has never really changed. There is no fruit for God. You know, is there such a thing as a fruitless Christian? The New Testament answer is no. Now, there, there are varying levels of fruit bearing, and sometimes it can look as though someone doesn't know Christ when indeed they do. But the idea that you could truly be born again and there be no fruit for God is contrary to the very purpose for which Christ died. He, he died in order that we might bear fruit for God. And without Him, there is no fruit for God. So that when someone claims to know Jesus, but the fruit being manifested in their members is fruit for death, now we have an explanation for the warnings, passages we find in the New Testament. Now we have an explanation, for example, for what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, very famous verse. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Let me just stop there. See, that's the part of the verse we often focus on. One day there'll be people there who said, Lord, Lord, have we not preached in your name, performed miracles in your name, done many wonderful things in your name? And Christ says to them, depart from me, I never knew you. We know that part of the verse very well. But the last statement Jesus makes, we often don't give proper emphasis to. Remember how he ends that statement? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me. And then he says this, you workers of lawlessness. You said you knew me. I never knew you. And the fruit was there that told the story, if you had just paid attention. Because while you claim to know me, you were a worker of lawlessness. What characterized your life was habitual sin. This is, this is so important. How often are we exhorting someone to genuine faith in Christ and they're holding on to some past profession? They're holding on to, to a baptism or the walking of an aisle or something they say about Jesus when the New Testament grants us no assurance if the habitual fruit of our life is one of sin that, that would reveal no change 
an unregenerate condition. How many people have we tried to help them along the pathway of sanctification when what they needed was justification? And so we keep teaching them the Bible and teaching them the truths of God. And they're lot, in fact, it doesn't, not only they're not getting better, it seems like they're getting worse because they may indeed be. The, the law of God arouses sinful passions in people who are unregenerate. The need is salvation. So death to the law was necessary to be free from the condemnation of the law. That's true. But death to the law was also necessary to be free from this sort of confinement, we could describe it as, this, this slavery to sin that belongs to those who are still bound to the law. Without this death and new life in the Spirit, the best the law of God could ever do was restrain us externally but arouse our sinful passions internally. But death to the law does mean new life in the Spirit. Look at verse 6. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve, we who know Christ, we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. There are only these two possibilities in a person's life. Either we're still bound to the law or we've been freed from the law. And if you've been freed from the law, you're in union with Christ. You're either bound to the law or you're bound to Jesus. One or the other. And if you are now in union with Christ, notice you serve. There is service in this new freedom. But now we're released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve. Just just stop there for a moment. Before we get to how we serve, just notice that we do serve. Freedom from the law is not freedom from God's authority. Freedom from the law is not lawlessness. Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. That's not the work of grace. Freedom from the law is not a self-centered, self-driven, self-pleasing life. Those who've been delivered from the law and joined to Christ serve God. How do you know which, which relationship you're in, bound to the law or bound to Christ? Well, are you serving God? Are you serving God? There's service in this freedom. And notice that it's freedom to serve in a new way. So that we serve, he says, in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. In the way of the Spirit, in the way that reflects new life, in the way that reflects an understanding of salvation, not serving God in a way where we're striving for His acceptance, because we know we have His acceptance in Jesus Christ. Not serving God in a way where we're striving to somehow atone for sins. What can I do to make up for the sins I've committed? Now, that's not how we live our lives. Christ atoned for our sins. We trust in His death. We trust in His atonement. We have atonement. We're not striving in that way. Not striving for a righteousness of our own but rather living our lives knowing that we've been given the righteousness that we need to be accepted by God, the very righteousness of Christ Himself. We are now free to serve God as people who've been forgiven, people who've been accepted, people whose sins have been atoned for, people who have righteousness before God that is alien to them, given to them as a gift in Jesus Christ. We serve now because we love the one who has saved us. The old way of the written code is a misuse of the written code. It's taking the law of God and trying to be saved by it. The new way of the Spirit is an understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ who fulfilled the law to bring us to God. We serve God, but we serve Him in a new way.
Tom Schreiner commenting on this, he says this, the genitives, pneumatos, spirit, and grammatos, letter, could be understood appositionally, newness in the spirit and oldness in the letter. They're more likely both genitives of source, that is, newness that has its origin in the spirit and oldness that stems from the letter. The oldness derived from the letter is a commentary on verse 5, where the sinful passions were stimulated by the law. Thus, as in Romans 2.29, the letter refers to the Old Testament law and its inability to affect righteousness apart from the Spirit. The letter refers to the commands of the law that are unable to produce the righteousness demanded. Did you get that? Let me just stop. Schreiner's saying this, and I agree, that what the law could do is it could point us to what was righteousness, but it couldn't produce it. He goes on to say this, the letter of the law demands, but does not enable obedience. Moreover, the letter of the law actually kindles the desire to sin and produces more sin than if the law were lacking. The newness brought about by the Spirit, conversely, must involve the living of a new life in which we bear fruit for God and walk in the newness of life. The newness of the Spirit fulfills the old covenant promise that the new covenant would give people ability to keep the statutes and the commandments of the law. Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel chapter 36, close quote. So here's my question for you as we finish this morning. Do you know this newness? Have you come to know life in the Spirit? Has your old relationship to the law been put in the past, once under the law's penalty, once under the law's condemning voice, the law not only exposing your sin but condemning your sin, and there you stood before the law of God. And as you strive to keep it, as you strive to obey it, all that happened was that your sinfulness was put on display even more because you knew passions, you knew desires, appetites that were contrary to the will of God. And those appetites were actually stirred up and agitated through the knowledge of what was right and wrong in the sight of God. A miserable life, a wearisome life of misunderstanding the law of God so you're trying to take it in hand in order to be saved by it. Is that in your past? Is that your old relationship to the law? Do you know what it is now to know that all of that has, all of, all of God's will expressed in His law has been satisfied in His Son? His Son fulfilled the law by His life. His Son fulfilled the law's claims upon you by His death. His Son, who has been raised from the dead, now you've been brought into union with Him by faith. And you have new life, a new nature, you're a new creation, so that you're serving God in a new way. Not trying to earn God's favor, but giving thanks that you have it. Not trying to earn a place of acceptance, but knowing you're fully accepted. Not trying to atone for your sins, but knowing that you're fully forgiven. Knowing that you were loved first, now you love the one who loved you first. Do you know this new life in the Spirit? And if not, I exhort you today, you who are weary and heavy laden, call out to the one who takes that burden away forever. Cry out to the one who grants you new life and the forgiveness of all your sins. Cry out to the only one who can save you who will put an end to that old relationship to the law so that now your new relationship to the law is actually one where you hear the law in a way that does produce sanctification because it's life in the Spirit, not a legalistic life of trying to earn salvation. Cry out to Christ. And every brother or sister who's hearing me today, give God thanks that now you're able to serve Him in a new way. Not on the oldness of the written code, but in the newness of the Spirit, the new way of the Spirit. You're not in the flesh. You're in the Spirit if the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you have forever changed us. You've not only changed our position 
You've changed us, Lord, so that now the law, as we are exposed to it and taught it, we love it. It is more valuable to us, Lord, than silver or gold. We, we have in your words that which teaches us what pleases you, and this is what we're learning as your children, that which is pleasing in your sight. We hear your law now, Lord, as having been completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We look to our Savior. We understand your word in him and through him. And we thank you that in Christ there are new desires that belong to the new life. We have new passions, new ambitions, new attitudes that have been granted to us in your, in your Son and by your Spirit. This is wonderful. This is something that we can't take credit for. You made us to die to the law, Lord. You gave us this new life in Christ. We are thankful and we will forever be thankful for salvation as it is in Him. Oh, Lord, may you grant salvation this day. Someone hearing me that they've been striving their whole life, trying to be pleasing to you, and yet all that has been revealed is more and more sinfulness. May they throw away all of their hope that they've placed in self-righteousness and place their only hope and faith in your Son. May you save today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.